So my name is Philip, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, messing around with the network, well, messing around with JavaScript and the DOM to figure out different network characteristics. And the title here is smaller than what's on the, uh, on the website, because that wouldn't actually fit in my slides. So uh, I'm going to get started. Um, everyone here a web developer? Yep, yeah, all right. So. The web basically runs on three protocols, HTTP at the top running on TCP and on that over IP. Below that, it can really be anything, but we have this trio of protocols made by three guys uh, over the course of maybe 20 years, starting from 1974 on. Incidentally, they have just one beard between them. So Vince Cerf, Bob Kahn, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee. Vince Cerf's the only one with the beard. Uh, later on, we got... JavaScript, and one, one guy with one beard discovered the good parts. So we're going to throw all of that out of the window and play with the nasty parts. Right? So number one, latency. Who knows what network latency is? Great. So I have, I have 30 minutes, and I have a lot to cover. Um, who wants to time me? Someone want? I've got six different topics to go through, so let's hope five minutes per topic, right? So let's do latency, and let's see if I can keep it under five minutes. So this, uh, this is an image from cablemap.info. It's looking at uh, one of the undersea cables between, uh, that goes between Germany and the US. Typically, it takes light about 23 milliseconds to go from Berlin to New York. Um, if you put that through fiber, it takes 35 milliseconds because light travels at 66% of its speed within fiber. Now, if you actually need to go uh, send a network signal, you need to send light there, send it back, and actually do it two more times because of uh, losses within different devices. So that 35 milliseconds actually becomes something like 70 milliseconds. So if you try to ping from one end to the other, that's more or less what you'd see. 70 to 80 milliseconds. Um, this is fine. We know this because of physics. We know this if we actually see two cities. Uh, we know how long it's going to take. But what happens if you're sitting on your web server, you have no idea where your user is coming from, or you know where they're coming from based on their IP address, but you don't know what route they're taking to get to your box. So you want to do some other, something else to measure the actual latency. And that's what we're going to look at. So. Latency or round trip time, which is what we really care about, is the time it takes to send a packet and get a response back from the user. So if we look at an HTTP request, it looks like this. Uh, the client sends a GET request, and the server handles that request and sends back a response. Now, if your GET request is small enough, it should fit within a single TCP packet. So one HTTP request is actually one TCP packet. And if your response is small enough as well, it should fit within another TCP packet. So you'll get back a response, and you'll get back an acknowledgment as well with that. Everyone OK so far? So how would we measure this time? Any guesses? Using only JavaScript within the browser? Yep. You take the date, so the date of now. Right. Right, so that's actually exactly what my code does. <laughs> so uh, I take the start date, uh, set a timer that measures the milliseconds of the current time, uh, then load an image from wherever my server is, and on the onload, I measure the end time, take the difference, and that should be the round trip time, right? Who thinks that's right? Anyone else? Everyone else thinks it's wrong? Why do you think it's wrong? The browser needs processing time. We, so the, the browser is going to fire the onload as soon as the, the image is available. This is not being displayed on screen. So it's, it's just uh, as, as long as it's available there, the browser is going to fire the onload. So it's not a problem with browser processing time. Uh, the server could require some processing time to actually load that image from disk. But let's say we do this uh, for every single user. We do it more than once. 
that image is going to be cached in RAM. So we don't even worry about that. Anyone else? So that's right. Uh, the time it would take to download the image. We can make our image small enough. So I typically use a one by one GIF, which is 35 bytes in size. 35 bytes plus a header of 312 bytes is totally less than 1,024 bytes, which is uh, uh, more or less what a TCP packet is. So even with uh, downloading the image, it should still fit in a single TCP packet. And we can't get smaller than that. Uh, don't you have a, a TCP handshake first? Perfect. And, uh, so our problem is a TCP handshake, right? So we're not really measuring just the round trip time. We're measuring TCP handshake plus round trip time. So whenever you make a first request to a server, what happens is your client sends a SYN packet. That's one TCP packet. The only thing it has is a flag that says SYN, uh, saying synchronize. And the server responds saying, I acknowledge your SYN, and I send you my own SYN. And then the client has to respond saying, I acknowledge your SYN. So now we've come, completed this three-way handshake, and our connection is established. And that's when you can start sending data. So we actually send three packets to and fro before we send our first GET request. So what we're doing in this case is actually measuring the time of five packets, right, and not two packets. So how do we get around that? Any guesses? Sorry? Handshake first. How do I measure when my handshake's done? How do, how do I measure when the handshake is done? All right, pretty good. Keep alive, so let's keep that in mind. Keep alive. Uh, anyone else? Fetching two images. Fetching two images, right. So fetch two images with keep alive. So you guys are actually, have you seen my slides before? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so basically that's what we do. We, we rely on the fact that HTTP 1.1 by default has connection keep alive. So. Uh, what that means is when a client makes a request to a server, it'll keep that TCP connection open for a certain amount of time, typically defined by the default keep alive uh, time. Uh, I think that's between 15 and 30 seconds, depending on your web server. So this client makes a connection to a TCP connection, so it does the handshake. And once that handshake is done, it'll keep that connection open for 15 seconds and make as many requests as are necessary on that same TCP connection. So what we do is we do one request, do a get. That, that would initiate the first handshake. The onload would fire after the image is downloaded. And then do another request, right? And that second request does not need a handshake because it's going over the same TCP connection, as long as we start that request after the first image was downloaded. So the code to do that is slightly more complicated, but not too much. Uh, we go through two images. On the onload event of the first one, we download the second one. Uh, is the code clear to everyone? If you have any questions with the code, uh, you can ask me. But basically, that, what it's doing is it loads an image on the onload event, measures the time, and then loads the image again. We throw in some cache busting code in there because we don't want the, the second load to come up from cache. We want it to always come from the server. So now we have two, the, the same image loaded twice from the same server. Uh, the round trip time is really the, or rather, the latency is the time it took the second image to load. And then now we, that we know the latency, if we subtract that from the time it took the first image to load, we also know how long it takes the TCP handshake to ha uh, happen, right? Any questions about that? So now we can compare, because now we know it takes three packets to do a TCP handshake and two packets to download an image. Typically, that image should be two-thirds of the, so RTT should be two-thirds of TCP. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? How am I doing on time? Nine minutes, so I'm good. I finished two parts in nine minutes. The third part's going to be tough. So you'll notice that we've ignored DNS lookup time here. Right. The first connection was actually, it doesn't just do a TCP handshake, it also needs to do a DNS lookup. And we're going to ignore that for now. Right. We'll assume DNS has been cached, but we'll deal with that later uh, 
assuming I have time. So a few notes on this. I use a one by one GIF. Uh, it's 35 bytes in size. I've experimented with different types of images. The first thing I tried was just send a 204 header back. Uh, 204 is no content, so I don't actually send any data. Uh, the problem with that is it'll fire an on error event and not an on load event. Does anyone see a problem with an on error event? I could still measure the time when the on error fires, right? You might get a error. Exactly. I might get a different error, right? What happens if the uh, user's network isn't connected? or the network drops after he loads my first page. So I'm going to get an on error simply because you couldn't connect to the server. Or there could be a DNS outage or any other outage that's going to cause that error, which won't actually measure the latency. So I definitely want an on load event. Uh, I then tried a PNG, with, uh, which was zero bytes in size. That also doesn't work. Uh, it also fires an on error. Uh, another interesting with, thing with a 204, is on certain mobile devices, it doesn't fire any events. So there's no on error, no on load, nothing. It might, it actually loads up, but it doesn't, doesn't fire any events. So this was the smallest image I could possibly get that actually fits within a TCP packet and also fires an on load event. Um, fires an all, right. So the third one I'm going to do now is network throughput. Uh, does everyone know what network throughput is? Now, how does it differ from bandwidth? Not a really late connection, but after an hour, you get 12 petabytes of data. Right. So you've got great throughput, but really bad latency. Right, right. So you think of it like uh, the station wagon thing, right? You can put uh, hundreds of magnetic tapes worth of data in a station wagon and drive from one place to another, and you'll have really high bandwidth. Right? because you get so many petabytes of data across, but the latency is so bad. So yeah, effective throughput is not very good uh, if you take the whole amount of time that it takes to get the data across. Uh, what we're actually going to measure is uh, how, much, uh, how much effective use of our uh, network connection we can use. So even if I have a three meg data connection, I might only be able to use one meg of it to actually download data. Um, because of various reasons. So it should be fairly simple to calculate, right? Download something large and measure how long it takes to download that. Is everyone okay with that? Or do you see holes in this approach? All right, so looking at that, it should be fairly simple. We take the same code that we used before, just use a larger image. And uh, instead of just taking the time, we take the size. So we use an image of known size divided by the time. I also multiply by 1,000 here because time is in milliseconds, and I want kilobits, well, kilobytes per second or kilobits per second, depending on how I uh, store the size. So does this make sense? Do you think this will work in all cases? Uh, TCP or IP packets overhead. Yeah, there is going to be some overhead. Uh, do we care? Is it, uh, who here is a network en engineer, not a web developer? Right. So as web developers, we don't care about TCP overhead. We care specifically how long does it take. If I have an image that's uh, 200 kilobytes, how long is it going to take for my user to download that? So I, I don't really care about uh, TCP overhead, even though, yeah, I know it's going to be there, and my throughput for me as a web developer is how, how much usage my HTTP data is uh, going to make of the network connection. So the problem with this, it works in some cases. It works as long as your uh, image is small enough. So naturally, I, w I would have finished the talk now if it were that simple. The problem is something called TCP slow start. Who's familiar with TCP slow start? You want to tell us what it is? Yeah, it, it, it starts at a lower rate, and, right. it, and if it, uh, the client accepts at a higher rate, it's, the server starts to send at a higher rate later, right. until the client drops again, and right. then TCP will restart the connection and make a slow start again until All right. it hits the limit. So yeah, TCP slow start was basically created to, to avoid network congestion. Let's assume that a server sends data as fast as it possibly can. 
Now, typically, servers are way faster than, or servers' network connections are way faster than a home user's network connection. So if they just throw out data as fast as they possibly can, uh, the network's going to get clogged somewhere in between, and everything else is going to slow down. So what servers do is they'll send two packets first, and then wait, oh, well, any end of a TCP connection. We'll send two packets and then wait for an acknowledgment. And when it gets the acknowledgment, it says, uh, if it gets the acknowledgment within a certain amount of time, it says, OK, this client can actually handle uh, that speed, so let's try increasing the speed. So it'll double it and keep, keep increasing it uh, as, as long as it keeps getting acknowledgments within the amount of time. Now, if any acknowledgment actually doesn't come through in the amount of time, the, the other end will assume that, all right, this end is congested. It's, Buffers are full, it can't accept more data, so I'm going to back down and reduce the, uh, reduce the number of uh, packets I can send. So by default, the window size is set to two, which means I'm going to send two packets and then wait for an acknowledgment. And when I get the acknowledgment, I'm then going to send four packets and wait for an acknowledgment, and so on. So the problem is we have all this dead time, right? Between sending the second packet and second, sending the third packet, we're, we're doing nothing. The network's not being used at all. And so we're not really measuring uh, how good that network connection is. We're measuring uh, for just opening a connection at that point of time how, how good it is, not how, how good it's going to be going forward. So we need to do something else. Uh, a simple thing is uh, use a resource that fits within a window. right? So something that fits within two packets, is that going to work? Any guesses? Can we use maybe a two kilobyte image and say, I'll measure the time it took a two kilobyte image to download? The problem is we have a wide variety of network connection types that vary in the, the effective bandwidth they provide to users. So you use a two kilobyte image on a three megabit connection, it's going to download really fast. It's not going to use up any of the bandwidth at all. You want to use a large image for some uh, network connection that fast. But what happens if you use a net large image and, um, was that it? Yeah, that's it. So try and use uh, a different image. So start off with a small image that's going to fit within that two packet size. And then once that is downloaded, I say, OK, now my window size is going to be increased. So let's now put in an image that's going to fit within four packets. And once that downloads, then try loading an image that's going to fit within eight packets, and so on. Right? So keep increasing it until I reach a level that I'm comfortable with. So th this is more or less the code that would do that. It goes through multiple images and calculates the time it would take to download each of them, and then says, OK, that's my effective bandwidth, looking at the largest image. The problem with this is slow network, really large image say, a 100 megabyte image on a 64 kbps connection, how long is that going to take to download? Right. Even with a full window size, it's going to take a long time. The user's just going to be waiting for you to do your measurement. So not a good idea. So what we ended up doing is, uh, let's say we, we throw in a timeout and say, all right, I'm going to download still download images in ascending uh, size, but I'm going to set a timeout value for each of them. So if an image times out, if it takes longer than, say, uh, 0.8 seconds or one second to download, I'm going to say, OK, this network connection cannot handle an image larger than this size, and that's where I'm going to stop. So we go from, we actually tested with uh, images starting from 11 kilobytes going all the way up to uh, 600 megabytes. So we have images of those sizes, and we set our timeouts at between 800 milliseconds and 1,200 milliseconds. So if an image times out, we say that's the last image we're going to download, measure the time it takes that image to load. And this is what we're doing here. So we have a ti set timeout there. When the timeout fires, we just set, uh, say that this image expired the timeout. Um, if the image is on load, actually fires, clear the timeout so that we don't, uh, we don't fail it. And then uh, we end the test if any of the images time out. So when an image times out, we say, that's the end of the test. Let's go ahead and start measurement at that point of time, uh, do our calculations at that point of time. The calculation code is actually the, pretty much the same as what we saw in the first case. Just take the size of the largest image and the time it took to download, and divide the two, get the bandwidth. So 
Do you think that's good enough? Uh, so the mobile networks um, have image reduction proxies that right. are very All right. Uh, how would we deal with that? Um, let's uh, check some images, I guess. Check some of the image? Yeah, make sure that what you're receiving actually matches what the... How do you check some an image on the client side? Canvas, I guess. Uh, okay. Throw it into Canvas, get the image data, and check some. Yeah. All right, I've never tried that, so I've, I've never tried that, so I don't know. But uh, actually, thinking about mobile networks, uh, we actually saw a problem, not just with mobile networks, but m different kinds of networks. Uh, if you run the same bandwidth test multiple times, you're going to get different results, right? Simply because there's network jitter, there's other things happening on the network, so. Um, you can't really rely, just do a single test and say, that's my user's network throughput. I'm going to store it in a cookie and assume that that's how fast their network is every time they come to us. So I'm not going to show you the code here, but what we end up doing is uh, statistical sampling. We run it the same test multiple times at different times and then take the median of all of them. So we don't take the fastest. We don't take the slowest. We take the median and say, that's more or less the, an order of magnitude of the user's network throughput. So uh, typical error rates we've seen is actually 25 to 30% in actually getting the network throughput, whereas in terms of latency, we see an error of uh, 0 0.5 to 1%. So you can see the difference in, in accuracy of the two different measurements. So the code is actually fairly big. Uh, if you do want to see the code for this, it's in the Boomerang project, which is on GitHub. And I have a link to that at the end of my slides. Right. So number four, DNS. How am I doing on time? Eight minutes to go. So we spoke about DNS briefly in the beginning. Anyone know how we're going to calculate DNS time? No one? <laughs> right. So yeah, that's, that's more or less what you do is make two requests, one with the host name and the second with the IP address, or uh, the other way around, and take the difference between the two. So time with DNS minus time without DNS, which is the same code, again, that we've used, except we have different host names. Right. So this works in many cases, except uh, what happens if the DNS, uh, the host name was already cached in the browser's DNS? Is there some way to flush the cache? On the server, you can do an RNDC flush. You can do it? RNDC flush. Is that going to happen immediately? Uh, you have to run the server, so. Yeah. Uh, someone else had their hand up? Look up an invalid host name. Look up an invalid host name, which will return an on error. And you, that'll, that'll have, uh, return an on error, right? And you can't tell the difference between an on error f because uh, the DNS was wrong or because something else failed. Yep. You could set up, um, I don't know, the and right. query a random one. So pretty much that's, uh, that's what you do. I'm, I'm not putting the code here, but if DNS was already cached, what you'd do is set up a wildcard DNS entry on your server. Say anything dot hostname.com maps to this one IP address. And then generate a random hostname on the client side. Uh, just base64 encode a, a random number and s look up that host name. So the probability of it being cached is pretty low. Right? There's still a chance that that random host name was already cached, but it's fairly low. So you do a lookup for a random host name. Uh, there's another problem. So we're looking at host name and IP address. What happens if we're doing, uh, we are assigning uh, IP lookups based on geolocation? So you can't just use a static, a static IP address in that case. Any guesses? You're controlling the DNS though, right? Yeah, well, you may or may not be controlling the DNS, so. Uh, you can that as well. So, OK, if you do control the DNS, yeah, you, you know exactly where they're coming from when they make the request. So you can set the IP at that point of time. Again, you might be ra round robin, uh, going round robin between host names within a single, between IPs within a single zone. So another way to do that is uh, you do one lookup with the host name. Uh, 
Then do another lookup. Uh, after you finish the first lookup, do two lookups in parallel. So do two image loads in parallel, right? So the first one is going to do a DNS lookup plus a TCP handshake. The second one is going to use the, the connection that's already open. So there's no DNS lookup, but it does uh, just as a round trip. Using those two, you get DNS plus TCP. And then the second one that's running in, or rather the third one that's running in parallel does a TCP handshake plus a round trip. So you take the difference of the first and the third one, and that gives you the DNS lookup time. So I haven't put code here for that because, again, it gets way too complicated, but you can look it up in uh, the DNS plugin in Boomerang. Right? So Boomerang has various plugins for uh, doing network lookups, and this is in the DNS plugin. How am I doing on time? Five minutes to go. Two parts to go. <laughs> so <laughs> IPv6. Um, what do we really want to measure with IPv6? Well, IPv6 is still not very widely spread. So the main thing we really want to know is, well, is IPv6 supported by this user uh, or this user's network connection? And if it is supported, how fast is it? Uh, not just how fast is it, but how fast is it to do a DNS lookup uh, uh, for a quad A, um, quad A record, and how fast is it to just load an image from there? So. We do uh, two different things. First, try to load an image from an IPv6, so a host using the IPv6 address, not using a host name, but using the IPv6 address itself. Uh, if that times out, and we set a reasonable timeout, if that either times out or gives us an on error, then we say IPv6 is not supported by this host, so we'll just stop at that point of time. If it does go through and we do get a response, then we measure the latency of that and go through the next step, which is try to load the same image using a host name. Uh, so the first test, first test checks if IPv6 is supported. The second check, uh, test checks if DNS lookup of IPv6 host works. So it's important that this host name only resolve to an IPv6 address and not to an IPv4 address. Um, I've had trouble finding uh, some hosting providers don't actually let you do that. They'll always give you an IPv4 address and let you add an IPv6 address to it. So if you have that kind of a provider, you can't really do this test. Uh, things like Linode will allow you to do that. Uh, EC2, uh, if you use the, uh, the load balancer, it allows you to assign only an IPv6 address. So using that, you can tell whether DNS lookup works for IPv6 or not. So again, the full code for this is in Boomerang's IPv6 plugin. It's too big to fit on a slide, so I've not put it here. Does anyone want to see it? I can open it up in a text editor. No? All right. <laughs> so finally, uh, network scanning using JavaScript. How would you go about this in two minutes? <laughs> so network scanning is actually quite a, a wide topic. But what we care about is a few different things. First, find out uh, what kind of network the user's on. And secondly, uh, do they have anything interesting running on their private network? Right. So the interesting thing about JavaScript running within a browser that's different from a port scanner or something running on my host is that JavaScript has access to the user's private network. So if the user's on a LAN connecting by a gateway to the internet, I can get JavaScript in there onto their browser that's then going to run with the privileges of their browser. So it has access to the internal network that I don't have access to from outside. So you can scan the user's private LAN. How would you do that? Well, try and load something from 192.168.1.1 or 0 .0.1 or 10.0.0.1. You can iterate through these pretty quickly, run them all in parallel, um, and find out what loads. Um, once you find out which network they're on, whether they're on 192 or 10.0.0, uh, then you'll start looking for common, uh, look for standard uh, routers. So every single router, whether it's uh, a Linksys or a Netgear or something, they have a logo, right? And that logo is not protected by uh, an admin username and password. So try to lo load that logo image. If the lo logo image loads, if you get an onload event firing, you know that's the kind of router they're using. Then you basically try standard exploits for that particular router. <laughs> try and gain access to it. Most people don't change default usernames and passwords. So 
you could actually try and log in. It, it, assuming they're already on the private network, they can actually get admin access. So they don't allow admin access from the external interface, but they allow admin access from the internal interface, except JavaScript's going in from the internal ex interface. So yeah, you, you can get uh, admin access. If you're lucky and they've recently logged in, the cookies are still in their browser, and the browser will happily log you in uh, without you having to pass uh, username and password in uh, using a 401 auth. So that's, that's one thing to do. And there's actually an example. Uh, this guy named Sami Kamkar uh, built uh, a script that will actually do all of this, go into your router, get your MAC address, do a, a Google location lookup, and figure out your home address just by you visiting a website. <laughs> the other thing you can do is then scan the internal network. So instead of, once you know which network, which subnet they're on, you start scanning that for interesting ports. So look for port 80, look for port 22, look for port 443, uh, 3306. Uh, you can look for the admin ports of different database uh, services and measure how long it takes to respond. So in most cases, you'll always get an on error for these things because, uh, let's say, a MySQL server is not going to respond to an HTTP request. So you'll get, it's, well, it's not going to respond with HTTP. You're going to get MySQL protocol back. So you'll get an on error for most of them. But you, you'll get some error. So if it's a short timeout, that means you make a request, there's nothing there, you get a connection uh, refused error. That times out really quickly. Remember, it's on their local network. It's not going over the internet. So it times out quickly. If it takes a little longer time to time out, and you'll actually have to test this out on your own network to find out what it is. So a little longer to time out, it means something's listening there, but it's not HTTP. And if it takes a fairly a reasonably long time to time out, it's probably HTTP. You got a response from an HTTP server, but it's not an image. So it timed out. Or it actually, you got an error at the, uh, at the parser level, within the browser, rather than at the connection level. Then you try an iframe. So an iframe can load any HTTP content, and it'll return an on load if HTTP loads, and an on error if non-HTTP loads. So those are the different things you try. And that basically concludes my talk. Two minutes over. Right. So source code for most of this stuff is uh, either at the Boomerang project, yep. Or uh, the last one, the network scanning stuff, is uh, at sami.pl slash map XSS. Any questions? So let me repeat the question. It says, by scanning internal ports, can we figure out what the business of that particular person is? Right. Uh, I don't know. Anyone? Just by knowing what services they're running internally, would you be able to tell what? Right. Assuming it's running HTTP. Because oh, no, no, no. But, but would, you, would you get that back using JavaScript that can only read HTTP? I don't know. Maybe you can get JavaScript to read other ports. Well, no, you, you can get it to connect. So you know that it can connect, uh, but you'll always get an error. You won't actually get a response. I know a guy got using HTTP and JavaScript to uh, attach to send mail and send mails using like bunch of things that ended up being valid SMTP. Uh, but you'll always have an HTTP header there. So yeah, I don't know. Able to all right, all right. So I don't know. You can do various things. I've also tried doing a SOAP, so doing posting to a SOAP service. If you can send a crafted SOAP request and find out what server's running there, you can do interesting things. Sometimes, again, if there's uh, insecurely configured services, you can actually get that service to post a response back to your external web service. So you can get it to do like an LS or do whatever and send data. So actually post data to your external web service where you then see what's running there. All right. Any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Right. So we are not really reading anything. We're just testing to see if something's there or not. Uh, uh, you can't you can't really read what's there because it's cross domain. Although it's running as a script node within your uh, within your um, within your page, and it, it's loading an image. So you can make a cross domain request. You can't, just can't read the the response. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop here and let the next speaker take over. All right? If you have more questions. <laughs>